I am choosing to go. I am choosing to follow Jesus. I am choosing to obey the Great Commission. I am choosing to love the way that he first loved us. I will not settle for anything less. I am choosing to be a disciple of Jesus. Radiant family, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to bring the word of God to you this weekend. And so what I want you to do is I want you to pull everybody in who's in the house or wherever you're at, a watch party on your back deck, and uh, get your Bibles out because today we're going to continue on in this series we've been in all fall called Disciple. And the title of the message this weekend is Transformed. We're going to be talking about spiritual transformation. And before we jump into the word, I just want to express uh, my heartfelt gratitude and thankfulness to all of you who sent condolences and encouragement and cards and different things to Jane and I uh, at the loss of my grandfather, uh, my grandpa Cummings, who went home to be with the Lord last Saturday this week. Uh, Jane and I were up north and uh, conducted my grandfather's funeral. And uh, yesterday, uh, we actually buried him in the ground, knowing, though, that his spirit and his soul is in the presence of the Lord. And that overjoy, that uh, fills our heart with so much joy. And uh, we just feel so encouraged and so strengthened by all of you. So we just wanted to say thank you so much for that. And you know, today as we're talking about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus versus a cultural Christian and the process of spiritual transformation, my grandfather is a great example of that. He lived and loved Jesus for over 70 years. Every day of his life, he read the scriptures. He was a disciple of Jesus, but he wasn't born a disciple of Jesus. He was formed into a disciple of Jesus, into the image of Christ, the one that he loved and he served by the Spirit of God. And so today I want to bring this, this teaching to you called Transformed. And as we've said every weekend so far in this series, our definition of a disciple is a disciple is someone who finds, follows, and is becoming fully formed to be like Jesus. A disciple is someone who finds, is someone who follows, and someone who is being fully formed to be like Jesus. This is the definition of a disciple. It's not just somebody who's prayed a prayer, even though that's where it starts. It's not somebody that just uh, ascribes or mentally ascends to a belief in a historical figure named Jesus, although that's definitely part of it. Those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Believing in God is important, but it's not the end of the story. A disciple is three parts. You find, you follow, and then we're transformed. We're formed by the Spirit of God to to what? To be like Jesus. And that's what I want to talk to you about today because it's important that we understand these three facets. And the first two, the find and the follow, are significant because they set the trail for us, the way of Jesus, to go from where we are when we find Jesus or when Jesus finds us, and it leads us down the path and the process of being transformed. So let me just give you some thoughts about this definition as we lead into the discussion about transformation. Number one is this, that it's important that we know that we find Jesus at our born-again experience. We don't find Jesus in just a book by reading about Jesus. We don't find Jesus by going to church but it's important that we have a born-again experience when we're confronted with the reality that Jesus is who he said he was, that John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father except by me. Well, how do we have this, this encounter with Jesus, this finding of Jesus, this born-again experience? Jesus spoke about it in John chapter 3. He's having a conversation with a Jewish rabbi whose name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to him at night, 
That's why they call him Nick at night. And he comes to Jesus. I'm sorry, I just had to throw that in. He comes to Jesus so that nobody else would know that he's doing it, and he wants to know how to receive eternal life. And Jesus says to him in John 3, verse 3, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he says in verse five and six, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus is speaking about a born again, a spirit birth that each and every one of us need to have in order to see the kingdom and to enter the kingdom of God. How are we born again? We're born again when we willingly, when we encounter Jesus, we're confronted with the reality of who he is and we submit our lives to Jesus. That's the beginning. That's where we find Jesus. And for me, finding Jesus, I always knew about Jesus my whole life. My grandfather talked about Jesus. My mom talked about Jesus. I sat in church, but I encountered Jesus as a 12-year-old boy where Jesus encountered me. I knew he was real. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that my sin separated me from God. And I knew that Jesus had paid the price for me on the cross. And I submitted my life, invited him to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. And I've never looked back. And so each one of us need to ask ourselves, when was it in our lives that we found Jesus? Because Jesus said you can't see the kingdom without this, without being born again. You're going to look for it, but you can't see it. You might be able to know where it's at, but you can't enter it, Jesus said, unless you're born again, born of the Spirit. This is where we find Jesus. This is our salvation experience. It's where we find Jesus. And where were you when you found Jesus? Think back today. Where was it that you had a salvation experience? Maybe you're watching this and you've never had a definitive salvation experience. Maybe today is the day that you actually find Jesus and begin the journey of following Jesus on the Jesus way, the narrow way that Jesus spoke about. Number two, we not only find Jesus in our salvation experience, but we follow Jesus in our daily direction. So remember, a disciple finds Jesus and then follows Jesus. How do we follow Jesus? Well, we follow him in our daily direction direction. Let me put it to you this way. A lot of us have good intentions when it comes to serving and imitating Jesus on the Jesus way and his way of living and his way of life. It's our intention. We come to church on Sunday and it's like we feel the anointing. We feel the presence of God in worship. We hear the message. The Holy Spirit works in our life and we make a decision. It's like that intention of our heart says, yeah, I want to live for God. But then Monday comes with increasing irregularity. I mean, it's there every other Every other day from Sunday, it's like you hit Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday. And a lot of times we set the direction of our heart in the opposite direction of following Jesus. We go places that Jesus doesn't want us to go. We we set our eyes upon things that Jesus doesn't want us to set our eyes on. We are walking a pathway with people that Jesus doesn't want us to walk with. Psalms chapter one, or it's, it's very clear. It says, don't stand in the path of the sinner or, seat, or sit in the seat of the scoffer. So think about that. Intentionality does not determine the direction of our life. It doesn't determine whether we're actually following Jesus. You can have good intentions. We've all had good intentions. We've all had good intentions about getting in shape, changing our diet, restoring a relationship. I mean, lots of intentions. But listen, it's not intention that determines the direction of our life, but it's the determination. The decisions and the determinations of our life that determine the direction and ultimately the destination. You will arrive exactly where you aim your heart. You will arrive exactly in the direction that you aim your 
determination. So it's not just intentions. Intentions are a starting point, but then we need to have decisions. In other words, we need to give Jesus our yes every single day, not just Sundays. It's easy to just say, okay, it's Sunday, so Jesus, I want to serve you. But what about Monday? What about Tuesday? What about today? Every single day of our life, we need to re-up our yes to Jesus. What does that mean? It means our direction of our life, of following Jesus, every single day has to become a determination of our life. Today, when I wake up, I make a determination. Today, I'm a follower of Jesus. Where he goes, I go. What he says, I say. What he thinks, I think. What he suffers, I suffer. Because making that decision yesterday was like the manna in the wilderness. It was good for yesterday. But if you go back in Exodus, God said you only take enough manna for the day. If you try and store it for tomorrow, it will stink and it will grow worms. And the intentions of our heart will grow worms and become full of stank if we don't re-up our yes to Jesus on a daily basis. This is what it means to follow him in our daily direction. Luke chapter nine, verse 62, Jesus said this, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is worthy of the kingdom of God. What's Jesus saying? In other words, we put our hand to the plow. We say, I'm gonna plow up this field. We put our hand to the plow, But if we look back, what are we looking at? We're looking back at the farmhouse saying, you know what? I don't want to be out here in the field where it's hot and where it's sweaty and there's a lot of work to be done. I don't want to plow up the roots, pull up the rocks. I don't want to have to deal with these animals. I want to go back to the house. I want to go back where I came from. I set my hand as a hired servant to plow this, but now I want to go back there. In other words, if the direction of our heart keeps shifting back where we came from, then our intentions are not enough. We have to daily follow Jesus. Number three, and this is where the rubber really hits the road when it comes to transformation, is we are formed to be like Jesus by aligning our habits with our hopes, which transforms the inner man. Aligning our habits with our hopes. This is where the spirit formation begins to take place. Listen to this scripture. Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from the New King James today because it's the most holy on this particular verse. They may put it up on the ESV, but the New King James, you need to like dig it out because it's so rich. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, or the ESV says your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Did you get that? Do not be conformed to this world, to this world's standards, to this world's belief systems, its values, its priorities, but what? Be transformed. In other words, shift from here to here. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, the way you think. This is where the inner man is transformed and changed. It happens when we begin to align our habits. That's what Paul's talking about when he says presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. Because listen, a lot of times we can talk about discipleship just from a spiritual in a very ethereal point of view where it's all very heavy. It's like, well, praise the Lord. And, you know, I just believe God's leading me and directing me and the Spirit's flowing. But The rubber really hits the road when it comes down to your daily flesh and blood habits. That's why Paul says, present your bodies, not just your soul and your spirit. God wants your soul and your spirit. But listen to me. The way that your soul and your spirit are brought into submission to Jesus and conformed into the image of Jesus is when you willingly offer your physical reality, your body, 
in all of the places that you go with your body, and all of the things that you do with your body, and all of the things that you say with your body, and all of the things that you listen to with your body, the things that go into your eyes, that go into your ears, the things that come out of your mouth, the things that you touch with your hands, the places that your legs and your feet take you, where you sit, who you're with, all of those things, they develop habits. I remember when our kids were in a charter school. It was a phenomenal school. They were in elementary school. We would oftentimes go to their assemblies. Every morning they had an assembly with these kids. They would sit down Indian style and the principal would walk up and she was just an amazing lady. And uh, she would kind of snap her fingers and the kids would come to attention. And they had this mantra. And she would say, and I'll, I'll probably get it really wrong, but she would say this, I watch, I watch my actions because my, let's see, I watch my thoughts because my thoughts become my actions. I watch my actions because my actions become my habits, and my habits determine my future. And these kids were getting this, and they were reciting it and repeating it with her, and it was so absolutely full of biblical truth, because that's what happens. I, we have to watch our thoughts. What are the, what are the guiding grid and database of thoughts that guide what you do habitually on a daily basis. See, last weekend we passed out this document called A Rule of Life. And if you didn't get one, we have the PDF that you can download online. And it's just a resource to talk about some holy habits. Because holy habits are not legalistic check-the-box rules of engagement, but they're actually some, guide, some guidelines and some guardrails. We call them holy habits or rules of life that if we put them into place intentionally and determined, they will actually begin to shape us and affect us from the inside out. You don't know it, but you and I are being discipled every day of our lives. We're either being discipled on purpose because we've made determinations about what voices we will listen to and whose opinions matter, especially on kingdom issues, or we're just by default letting in the voices and the loudest voices or the voices that appeal to our sinful nature, that is our default setting, the Bible calls it the flesh, it will begin to feed our flesh and our pain and our experiences and our fears and begin to shape how we engage with our physical body in this world in all of the different ways that we relate. The only way that you change that is by making a decision that I wanna bring my body, every part of me, body, soul, and spirit under the submission of Jesus and I'm gonna be transformed starting with the way that I think. I want my mind to be renewed. I want my habits to align with my hope. Well, what's my hope? Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my only hope. Why is he my hope? Because he's the only, the only salvation that there is to be found. And right relationship with God is found in Jesus. And so if Jesus is my hope, if Jesus is the one who went to the cross and suffered for me, if Jesus defeated death and rose from the dead, if Jesus can heal the sick, if Jesus has mercy and compassion upon the worst of the worst, if Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father right now, reigning and ruling over the universe, and I align my hope with that reality, if I really believe Jesus is going to return soon to the earth and set up his kingdom and rule and reign, and I'm gonna be right there with him, that should change the way that we live our lives, beloved. Because if, we, if Jesus is just kind of a, a fantasy, mythological uh, archetype of the best of humanity that we're subscribing to, well, then we can live like the world and this belief in Jesus won't change that. But if I really believe Jesus rose from the dead, that's my hope. And my habits need to get aligned with that hope. If I believe Jesus can heal body, soul, and spirit, then I've got to align my heart and my habits with that hope. If I say that I believe that Jesus is coming back, then how am I living today anticipating that reality? 
If I believe Jesus has given me the responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations, then am I aligning what I do with my time, with my focus, where I go, who I do it with, the people I commit and trust, the people I listen to, what I'm putting into my spirit, is that aligning with that reality? Because whatever you take in will begin to shape you. Which leads me to number four. Spirit formation is a holy collision that takes place at the intersection of us practicing God's presence and God's spirit changing us. It's a beautiful idea, church. Spirit transformation. It's a collision, a holy collision that happens at the intersection of us practicing God's presence. I love that phrase, practicing the presence of God. There was a book written a couple hundred years ago by a man named Brother Lawrence called Practicing the Presence of God. Because our practices or our habits or the things that we do by default, the things that we just kind of do subconsciously, practicing the presence has got to become part of that. And when we intersect that with a Holy Spirit that the Bible describes, the Spirit within us earnestly or jealously yearns for us, when we're hungry for God and the Spirit of God, which is hungry for us, intersects at the speed of love, that is a holy collision. And that's where change from the inside of us begins to happen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, and we all with unveiled faces, it's referencing Moses in the Old Testament on Mount Sinai going up into the presence of the Lord. It says, beholding the glory of the Lord, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And so the reference here is to the fact that Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the law from God to bring back to the people. And he's in the presence of the Lord for 40 days. What's he doing? He's practicing the presence of God. When he comes down off of the mountain, it says that the people put a veil over his face because his face was so affected by the glory of God that it literally radiated the glory of God and people couldn't even look at Moses for several days. So if that's the Old Testament, which is a weaker glory than the new covenant that we have with Jesus, what happens when we begin to practice the presence of Jesus in our hunger and in our thirst for Jesus, not just in our toleration of Jesus, not just in our acknowledgement of Jesus, but I'm talking about, God, I want to be like you. Lord, I want you to change me from the inside out, and I, I know that you can do it. You are my hope, and I'm going to pursue you. When that meets and intersects with the Holy spirit that says, I want you, and I'm in you. God the Father has asked me, and Jesus has sent me to dwell inside of you as the temple, to conform you, to bring you, and to shape you, and convict you, to look more like Jesus. Romans 8, 20, 29 says, to be conformed into the image of his dear son. The Holy Spirit's hungry to do this, church. And the question is, are we hungry? to practice his presence. I'm not talking about working harder. That's legalism, where we think that we have to earn the right for God to change us. That's a fleshly, carnal mindset that's called religion, and it's exactly what the children of Israel said to Moses when he came down off the mountain. They said, don't let God speak to us us personally, tell God to speak to you, and then you tell us what to do, and we'll do it. Well, we just want to live our lives one degree of separation. We want to be social distance from God. Tell God to stay six feet away, and Moses, you wear a mask. That's what we're asking, because we don't want to be contaminated by the glory of God. Listen, we need to get contaminated by the glory of God. We need to practice his presence. We need to come out of his presence like a trucker at 3 a.m. out of Denny's. He's been sitting 
in the non-smoking section, but if you've ever been into Denny's at 3 a.m., I'm talking the old days before they banned cigarettes, but if you used to go into a Denny's at 3 a.m., it didn't matter if you were sitting in the smoking section or the non-smoking section. When you came out of Denny's, you smelt like smoke. And you know what? We need to be people that when we come out of the presence of God, that we practice daily, and our hope is aligned with Jesus, we're, we're, we're walking out of his presence with the fragrance of his presence, with that glory shifting and changing on the inside of us from one degree of glory to another. It doesn't all happen at once. I know we would all love it to happen at once. I know that we would love to say a prayer and receive Jesus and to be instantly transformed and walk around perfect and holy and sinless and never struggle, but it's actually the battle of transformation that causes us to mature as we partner with God, that God doesn't do it all for us. Listen, every parent who's watching me knows exactly what I'm talking about. There are so many times it would just be easier to do it for your kids. But if you do it for your kids all of their lives, they will never grow up and be mature adults. They will always need you to do it. The goal of a parent is not to create dependency. The goal of a parent is to help children understand their true identity and to be full functioning human beings that can reproduce themselves. That's what a disciple is. We start with following Jesus, practicing the presence of Jesus. We become like Jesus so that we can help other people follow Jesus. We're not talking about sin management techniques. All right, I'm gonna stop sinning. I wanna be a disciple of Jesus, so I'm gonna stop sinning. The best way to stop sinning is actually marinating in the presence of God. In his word, in worship, in his presence, daily. You know, Paul talked about this. He said, pray ceaselessly, without ending. What does that mean? It means to walk daily in an awareness of the presence of God in our lives. It isn't self-willed. It's not some self-help program that we're talking about. We're talking about humbling ourselves daily, yielding to God's perspectives, practices, passions, and pursuits. Yielding to that. Because listen, I want you to hear me. Whatever we worship, we become like. Whatever we worship, we become like. Psalm 135, when it's making reference to the idols of the nations, it says this in verse 18. Those who make them, the idols, become like them, and so do all who trust in them. So it's saying that the people who make idols to worship actually end up becoming like them. Well, if that's true of making idols that we become like the idols that we make, it's even more true that we become like the God that we worship when we practice his presence. When we align our habits daily, when we come daily to the altar, and we create an altar, a secret place between us and God. Andrew Murray called it the inner chamber where it's us and the Father and we're in his word and we're praying and we're worshiping and we're repenting and we're asking, petitioning God to meet our needs. When we're sitting there in silence, when we honor the Sabbath and we take a day off and of rest to worship God, when we express generosity towards others, when we invest time and energy, all of these habits as we do these are practicing the presence of God. We become like we, what we worship and we become like what we meditate upon. Psalm chapter one, my favorite Psalm, verse number two says, but his, de law, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law or in his word, he meditates day and night. Who is he talking about? The man who's blessed. The reason why he's blessed is because he's becoming like what he meditates in. It gets in us. Which leads me to point number five. Centering our lives in God's presence and God's word becomes the foundation for all transformation. Did you get that? Centering our lives. Centering our lives on God's presence. Did you know that you can experience the presence of God wherever you are? Because what it means to practice the presence of God is to be intentional in your awareness, regardless of your circumstances, that God is in you and with you. All it takes to sense and to know the presence of God is to make a decision to become more aware of God with you 
than any other circumstance around you. As soon as you do that, he's very clear, I'm here. There's times where I'll talk about testimonies of ways that God has encountered me in the past or even talking about revivals of old. And just by meditating on those things or a scripture that has come to life will help me tangibly feel and experience the presence of Jesus and go, I can feel him. I know he's with me. Do you know that you can experience the presence of Jesus in the midst of the most difficult hours of your life? Think about the Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into a fiery furnace because they refused to worship or to bow down to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar. And you know who showed up with them in the fiery furnace? It says that there was a fourth man like the son of man. It was Jesus. His presence was with them in the fiery furnace. You see, his presence, like Paul said, no one stood with me except the Lord who stood by my side. And he wrote that when he was in prison. Paul knew the presence of God. Jesus knew the presence of God in the midst of difficult times. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knew the Father was there with him. Paul knew when he was in a dungeon in Rome that God was there with him. The three Hebrew young men in the fiery furnace knew that God was with them. And whatever you are going through today, I want you to know you can center your life on God's presence and his word. Listen to what Jesus said in John 15. He starts by saying in verse four, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear truth or fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, and whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and he withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Did you get that? Abide in me and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples as the father has loved me. So I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy, this is Jesus, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. When Jesus is talking about abiding in him, he's talking about centering our lives, practicing his presence, walking with him daily and anchoring our life in his word. Just like Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, he said, the man who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who built his house upon a rock. It's foundational. And when we live word-centered lives, practicing the presence of Jesus, not out of a legalistic list of expectations, but of an intentional determination in practicing an awareness of Jesus, aligning our habits with our hope in Jesus. I'll tell you what begins to happen. Jesus on the inside begins to re-align and remodel. He begins to renovate our lives. Our desires begin to change. Our perspectives begin to change. Love begins to grow for God and neighbors. Conviction, the volume of conviction and our conscience begins to elevate. Hunger begins to be stirred for more because hunger and thirst in the kingdom of God are different. They're the polar opposite of in the flesh. 
In the flesh, when you're hungry and you eat, you don't want to eat anymore. In the flesh, when you're thirsty and you drink, your thirst is quenched. But in the kingdom, the more you eat, the hungrier you get. The more you drink of the living water, the thirstier you get. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. When we drink of him and we feast on his faithfulness, we don't quench a hunger and a thirst. It's stoking the fires of our spiritual appetite and we want more and God wants more and that's where change begins to happen. Listen, it doesn't happen all at once, but it happens daily. Second Corinthians says this, we are being transformed and renewed day by day in the inner man. It's not what happens in one day that transforms you, but it's what happens day by day as the Spirit of God renews you. Isn't this beautiful, saints? God is at work in us. So matter, no matter what you're going through today, no matter what you're disappointed in today, no matter what yesterday wants to remind you of, no matter what tomorrow wants to make you afraid of, today we can practice the presence of Jesus and we can live in his word and we can let this become the foundation of our relationship with him and we can be transform, transformed from glory to glory, from strength to strength and from faith to faith. I wanna pray for us today and wherever you're at, I want you to hear this, you're not alone. Even in a room right now with maybe two or three or four, maybe more people, it's possible that you still feel alone. You might be all by yourself today. And I want you to know you're not alone because Jesus is with you. He's in this moment right now. He stepped into the room. And for those of us who are watching right now, I wanna spe specifically speak to those who can't look back and see a moment where you truly were born again. It's like, oh, I've always believed in God, I guess, and tried to go to church to be a better person, but I don't know that I've ever had a moment of being born again. What does that really mean? It means number one, you acknowledge Jesus is the only way for you to be saved from yourself and from your sin and the judgment that you deserve. Jesus paid it all on the cross and that by faith you can receive that forgiveness in the sight of God and by grace, unmerited favor, you can today be transformed, born again. A new life, eternal life begins right now if you will surrender. If you'll say, Jesus, I'm so sorry that I've sinned. I'm so sorry for the way that I've lived my life. I know I'm a sinner and I'm convicted of that, but I'm asking you, save me, rescue me. I believe that you died on the cross for me. Jesus, I surrender, I submit to you. Forgive my sin, come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. From this day forward, I don't wanna just believe in you from a distance. I wanna know you up close and I wanna follow you and I wanna be formed by your spirit to be just like you. I wanna be a student, Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I wanna walk in the way of Jesus. You can have my old life. It's broken, it's flawed, it's filled with pain, scars, and sin. You can have my old life if you'll give me your life in this moment right now. I want to be born again so that I can see the kingdom and enter the kingdom. Come into my life, be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. If you're somebody who's needed that, whatever you just heard me pray, that's what you need to cry out to God with. Just say, God, save me. And we have some prayer partners that are online right now that want to pray with you. So if you have prayed that or you need to pray that, right now, listen to me, not tomorrow, not 10 minutes, don't negate this. Jesus said, if we'll acknowledge him before men, he will acknowledge us before the Father. I'm asking you right now, if you know that you need to get right with God or you just prayed that prayer and you are being born again, you've been born again this moment, this has been your salvation, finding Jesus moment. Right now, I want you to just comment or I want you to email us at info at radiant.church. Follow the, uh, 
the prayer partners that are online or the comments with the links and let us know. Why do we need to do that? Because you need to acknowledge Jesus. We want to pray with you and we want to help you now learn to follow Jesus in the Jesus way. And the last thing I want to say is this for everybody. You may be listening and say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple. But I, I want more than anything. I want more than anything to be more fully formed like Jesus. Well, then for you, what I'm gonna encourage you to do is to take and evaluate your habits of practicing his presence. Because what happens in his presence on a daily basis where we align our habits affects the way that we walk, the way of our life. Jesus went and prayed and then he ministered. He went and he spent time with the Father and then everything he did was a result of what he saw the Father doing and he heard the Father saying. That is a pattern for all of us. And I wanna encourage you, don't just continue to do what you've always done expecting different results. Take the time, stop, and where we need to realign our habits with our hope. And if you don't have the resource, the rule of life, it's available and you can download that. It's absolutely free. It's gonna help you take a look at some of the holy habits that maybe you don't have or are inconsistent or you'd like to add into your life that's gonna help you grow. Prayer, fasting, reading the Bible, celebrating and honoring the Sabbath, giving and generosity, lots of different habits that will help you grow into everything that Jesus has for you. And the last thing is this, Radiant, we love you. And we're hoping, pray with us, that very soon, hopefully next weekend, uh, but we'll be communicating that this next week. We'll be meeting in person again. And we're looking forward to getting beyond this whole season and celebrating. We're gonna be a stronger church. We're gonna be an incredibly strong people. And our city is going to experience the presence of a living Savior like never before because we've been with him. Thank you. We love you. God bless you. And be radiant.